So Emily. Oh, Emily. <laughs> I, I thought about titling this episode, Why Isn't Everyone Having Sex with Emily? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Like, clearly, yeah. they, you should. You have to name it that. <laughs> but but really, but, but then it, it implies on of us, and I'm, I don't know if we have if enough they time. Deep, or they're going to click on it. <laughs> Uh, but I'm so grateful to be able to have this time with you just selfishly. I think you're so magnetic and outrageously intelligent and so brave and so kind and so fun. And so selfishly, I feel excited to get to <laughs> marinate and dance in your wisdom and in your transmission. And I'm really excited to talk about why isn't everyone having smarter sex and what even smarter sex is. But before we get to that, I want to know, like, at what point in your life were you like, you know what I'm going to do? What I'm going to do for a living? What I'm going to do for 20 years is produce over 3,000 podcasts on sex. I'm going to become, like, the world's leading expert in amazing sex. Like, what, at what point in your life were you like, this is my calling? Oh, well, Well, I was on a journey. I was having sex. I had sexual partners. And I kept finding that my partners were always having a good time. My male partners, they were finishing, no problem, having orgasms, and I wasn't. And that didn't seem fair to me, number one. Number two, I thought that something was wrong with me because yeah. everything I'd seen in media and television was man, woman, make out, have a great sex session, fall into bed, and everyone has explosive orgasms and fall asleep. And so I kept having this experience where like, I enjoyed sex, I enjoyed touch and cuddling and connection. But at the end of the day, I kept thinking, there's gotta be something more here. I also looked at relationships and thought, and even I had the experience of being in relationship with somebody. And after about a year, nine months, sex wasn't as hot. It wasn't as exciting. And then I used to always think, how do people stay in long-term relationship and still have incredible sex? So marrying those two thoughts, I just started talking to people about their sex lives. And about how old are you at this point? I was 35. Oh, 33, really? 33. When you started? Yeah. Wow. 33. Amazing. Yeah. So there I was. I had mostly been having performative sex, mm -hmm. faking orgasms, mm -hmm. doing what I thought my partner wanted, arching my back, moaning, always being down for sex, thinking that it wasn't okay to say no for sex because I'm also a perfectionist mm. and a pleaser. Mm. Well, that makes someone like, great for, 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 you know, someone for else. performing sex for somebody else. Yeah. But not for me. And so I thought, you know what, like this is, um, this is, this is, this is the time to figure out and I don't want, and it didn't, it felt disingenuous too. And it felt like I was living this lie yeah. because I was really good at sex, mm. right? As far as they're concerned, but it wasn't about my, you know, it wasn't for me. So do you know the Glennon Doyle quote in Untamed, which I have read 10 uh, times, she says, I knew how to be wanted. I did not know my own mm. want. Mm. And I feel like I am very much in that reclamation and in that discovery because I'm the same, like mm -hmm. former people pleaser, yeah. recovering codependent, <laughs> perfectionist, which is like a cocktail for oh, not yeah. having a great sex life. <laughs> exactly. And so I'm so glad that you decided mm. to like reclaim this for yourself. Yeah. So then, so then what happened? So then what happened was I started talking to some people. I realized that I, and then I heard about podcasting. This was 2005. I'd started making a little film about it. I was a documentary filmmaker. And then I heard about podcasting. Oh, what I loved about it was was that it was audio and not video because I knew that people would be more open. There's a certain anonymity to, to audio. Hired a sound, guy, a sound guy off Craigslist. I didn't, you know, he brought over a sound gear. I invited a bunch of friends over. I was living in San Francisco at the time. It was in my living room. People in all stages of relationship and sexuality, gay, straight, married, divorced, dating online. And I just interviewed them one by one about their sex life and their experiences. And when you talk about the moment that I knew, I sat there for six hours. I didn't go to the bathroom. I didn't have a drink of water. I was just in the zone, in the flow, and I had this like download. I was like, oh, this is it. Like this is the path to, to not only my healing, but the world's healing. Mm. And I just knew it. And I'd never had that certainty. You know what I likened it to, Emily? I likened it to everyone saying like, when you find the one, which uh -huh. I don't believe in, but but you're going to find the one. My drive was always about finding my purpose. Mm -hmm. Wasn't so much marriage and family. That was never on my list. It was like, how do I make change in the world to change myself, change others? And it was that like after 33 of working really hard all these years, I was like, ah, I found it. This is it. And I have never looked back. Wow. That's the path. I love that story. And I love that you like, created it like, oh, I found the one. I found my purpose versus like this idea that you're going to find some like completion soulmate, which I also Ugh, think is a no, problem. No, so boring. So why do you think <laughs> that us healing our sex, why is us having smarter sex going to help save the planet, heal mm. the planet? <sighs> wow. 
And I you mean, can talk as first, big or as spiritual as I you mean, want. I mean, I could go really big right now, but I'm going to, going to start with that our sexual health and sexual wellness is an integral part of our overall wellness and mm-hmm. our overall health. And most of us are still very much in the dark about sex. And let me explain what I mean by that. Because when I talk to people, like, but sex is everywhere now. You know, everyone's talking about it. You can get a porn. You can look at anything online. When I talk about smart sex, I talk about people, you know, feeling good in their bodies, learning how to receive and give, eradicating shame, trauma, like all the things that are keeping us from pleasure. Because when we have smarter, healthier, more pleasurable sex, it impacts all the areas of our life. So we feel more embodied, more connected, and have more pleasure. And that's just so important. But since and I, and I wish I could tell you it was different. And this is what keeps me going. You asked me earlier, like, I do ever get tired of talking about it. And it's a lot of talking. I'm always changing things up. But the truth is, every time I talk to a young person, and that's where a lot, a lot of my heart is, or even an older, older person, and they say, I've still never had an orgasm. Um, I have a lot of pain during sex. I no longer want to have sex. What's wrong with me? Am I broken? And this still happens every single day Mm -hmm. that we don't know our parts. We don't feel it, you know, it's okay to accept pleasure. So there's still a lot of work to do. But I think that the more we could look at sex consciously and have intentional sex and conscious sex, that will absolutely heal the world. Because think of what the repression of that has done. (laughs) I mean, look at war, right? If you look at war and in in the Middle East right now, that's all about repressing sexuality. And I think that that we're seeing that. So that's just one part of it. But think about other things that we do in our lives as a result of having that repression. We might act out more violence against women, um, just more, you know, mental health, child child, pornography, pornography. yeah, and rape, because we don't have an understanding about what it means to be a sexual being. And then in my book, Smart Sex, so when I was writing the book, I was like, okay, I've got all the tips. Because mostly people come to me for quick tips, right? Not, I mean, initially, that's how it started. I'm like, I can give anyone the next step. Like you want the position, you want the toy, you want the, you know, the thing to say, I've got you. But the truth is, that's just gonna get you so far. That might take you to the next step. But there is a holistic approach. So these five pillars are really about that there are all these factors that are going to contribute to you having better sex and they all matter. So you might have all the tips and tricks, but if you're not embodied and you're completely disassociated during sex, well, that's not going to be the smartest sex you can have. That's the first pillar is embodiment. Mm. And the next one is your health, you know, and that's your mental and your physical health. So perhaps you're taking a certain medication, you know, so many women are on the birth control pill or on, you know, SSRIs and men too. You know, my audience is always is half men, so I speak to everybody. They might be impacting your sex drive, your libido. If we're not moving our bodies and eating healthy, we're going to have a challenge with blood flow. Well, we need blood flow to have pleasure and feel like orgasm and ecstasy through our body. Mm -hmm. Um, The third one is collaboration. Mm. Like how well are we communicating and collaborating? Do we ever talk about sex? I can't tell you, Emily, how many people have said, I've been with my partner for 20, uh, 20 years and we've never talked about our sex life. Uh, We just sort of close our eyes and hope for the best. Or we talked about if we're going to do it or we're not going to do it. So there's the external talking, but then there's the like, what's my messaging around sex? Wait, I'm like shook right now. I need a minute to process (laughs) this. Process them. Because I live live in such a silo. I live in such an echo chamber, like living with Regina and being best (laughs) friends with Layla and my amazing partner, Adam. And like the idea of having an experience and not recapping about it, not sharing about it not being like oh I love this but this felt like an edge or like that feels so incomprehensible to me and Regina has baked into her work the idea of favorite frames and that um, unappreciated good turns to shit and so if you're not appreciating the things that are coming to you then it actually like rots Mm -hmm. and that if you don't digest and express the good then you don't have space for more it's like taking a poop Mm -hmm. it'd be like eating all day and never pooping (laughs) yeah like you actually have to release that to make space for more pleasure so the idea of a couple being married for 20 years and never talking about their sex life good bad or otherwise seems incomprehensible to me and yet i know that that is likely the norm i had a guy who called me the other day a friend of a friend and he's like i'm with this girl right now and she can only have he's a he's wildly successful has bought and sold a million companies like people revere this guy and he said i'm about to marry this woman we're engaged 
but she'll only, and this is just so, I mean, she'll only have sex with me when she's um, drunk hmm. because she just feels like she has to numb and I'm not sure what to do about it. But I told her that I was, ta- she, you know, I told her that, you know, I wanted to talk about it and she said she won't talk about sex. Hmm. So like, that's just someone like kind of in my circle. So I'm in a bubble too, like in my world and what I've been doing, but I realize, and then I talk to young people too. You know, young people, 18, 19 in college, same thing. The women are like, I've never had an orgasm. I've never masturbated. I can't talk about sex. So it's like, while there's been movement, people like Regina and yourself and Layla and myself, the, m- most of the world is still like, it is a do not go, do, can't talk about it. They, you know, so there's still a lot to be done. Mm. And, I mean, well, thank I, you for blazing the trail yeah. and for ma- giving people not only the permission, but also the tools to talk about it. Okay, so we've got three pillars. The first one is embodiment, embodiment, and then we've got mental and emotional health, Mm -hmm. and now we've got collaboration. Right. Okay. So collaborating, and then the next one is self is self knowledge. Mm. How well do I know? Do I know what my turn ons? Do I know what's required for me to be in the mood for sex? How does the room have to be? How does my partner have to touch me? What time of day? We, you know, there's a lot to be said for like sex knowledge, like just looking back at your history, what are the three most memorable times you've had sex? And what did that do for you? How did, what what do you remember? What was going on in that moment? And so it's like knowing our desire inventory, like I have something in the book called your desire inventory. Like just, do you have to have a conversation with your partner? You know, do you have to feel connected? Do the kids need a babysitter? Like there's just, we think that sex should just magically happen and maybe it does at the beginning, but just to be able to, what's our knowledge around our sex? And you know, Mm -hmm. that's that's important. And then we have um, acceptance, self-acceptance. And that really is about accepting, that's the confidence part. Do I accept my body where I'm at today? Do I accept my experience level? Am I okay with, you know, who I am as a sexual being? Mm. And let me tell you this about sex IQ. We never get there. You don't get a score. Like, you're not going to be like high on sex IQ and your life's over. It's more like I created these tools. So at any moment when somebody isn't feeling desire, they're not feeling turned on, they're not having an orgasm, they can kind of look at that and go, okay, well, I collaborated. I talked about it. I feel great in my body. But... You know, I actually feel like I've been disassociating a lot during sex, so I could work on that. And I'm on that medication. Maybe I should talk to my doctor about it. Do I really need to be taking this higher? So we can sort of work around and figure it out because there's so many layers to arousal. It looks different for all of us. Like what might turn me on might not turn you on. What turns our partner on might not turn us on. And But if we never talk about it in a healthy way, mm-hmm. and a lot of what I do over these years is communication. Mm. I mean, I really, I've got scripts in the book because it's like people are so terrified about talking about that they literally, I'll tell them what to say, like, well, back up. Well, how do I do it? When do I do it? Where do I do it? Because it's so fraught. So, okay. First of all, <laughs> thank you for writing this book. And, and so when you said with sexual IQ, we never get there. We never arrive. That's, meaning yeah. that it's just like a barometer for like, it's I'm bar- hot today. I'm cold today. You're never going like to be a barometer the perfect we, temperature and you stay there. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Because it's like, I, I still work on my sex IQ. Like I'm never done learning either. That's a thing. Like I'm always like, you know, different stages changing. of life. I'm always changing what I'm into, you know, 10 years ago, I'm not going to be into now. So it's really just a barometer for people to get comfortable and realize that it's not about like, you used to think, I'm going to be the best lover ever. I'm going to be great at sex. So I'm going to learn to give the best blowjobs and I'm going to do the sexiest things in the bedroom or I'm going to go as long as I want to. That's not what makes a great lover, right? There's just so many components to it. What do you think makes a great lover? I think what makes a great lover is being authentic and being connected, being present, being curious, being compassionate, Mm. being in your body. Mm. Be willing to laugh together. Know that sex is not a linear act. It ne- might never look the same. Being open, not judgmental. Being willing to learn with every partner. You know, a lot of people are worried that like, I hear this all the time. My my partner's been with so many other people than I have. Am I going to be a bad lover? And it's like, your sexual history really doesn't have anything to do with your with that being a great lover. It's about your connection with the person in front of you. Like, can we go there? Can we can we lock in? Can we connect? So I believe it's an everybody can can be a great lover, you know, starting at this moment. Well, what I'm noticing about all these tools, like even the the fifth pillar in the book, right? It's acceptance, 
And what you just said, what makes a great lover, right? Compassion, acceptance, communication, presence. These are all spiritual tools, right? Yeah. Like if you, let's say we're not even talking about sex yeah. at all, but you're taking care of your physical and emotional health. You are embodied. You accept yourself as you are. You're yeah. collaborative and communicating. <laughs> like you're going to be a happy person. You're going yeah. to be a healthy person and you're going to have the foundation to connect to spirit. You're going to have the foundation mm-hmm. to connect to the divine yes. because of all of these tools. And it feels like if that foundation is there and you feel so right and whole and good with yourself, then putting that with another person who's hopefully doing the same thing, it's like you're creating a bigger antenna. Mm -hmm. And I love the quote of like, where two or more are gathered, God is present, right? And Mm. so it's like you have then a really uh, fertile ground for the divine to drop in. Mm -hmm. So this this has been the area of my expertise. No, no, let's not say expertise. Let me say exploration (laughs) over the last three years. I'm very far from an expert, but, but deep, deep exploration and studentship. And it is how can we... One, utilize our sexual energy to manifest. Mm -hmm. Like how can we use this creation energy inside of us to create not only the life of our dreams, but the world of our dreams, Mm -hmm. but also as a spiritual practice. And so I'm curious, like in your work and in your dealings with couples, like what's the most wild transcendent sort of spiritual experience anyone has ever shared? Mm. Because like when I ask people, how do you feel after you orgasm? Usually it's like connected, open, pure, holy, free, blissful. You know, rarely do I hear like dirty, wrong, mm-hmm. bad, shameful, dark, raw, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so it's just reminding people that there is sanctity in this. Yes. There is sacredness in this, that there is God in this. And that we are in fact transcending our identity and connecting with totality. Mm-hmm. I mean, the French call it le petite mort. Like yeah. orgasm is practicing mm-hmm. dying, same as meditation. We're practicing dying. And so I'm just curious if you've ever heard a story or someone's been on the show or we are yeah. like, oh, we had this moment and it, it felt transcendent. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, you know, it's so funny after all these years I do, I don't have like, I'm trying to think of a specific moment. Mm-hmm. But I know that when couples do a practice together, you know, maybe they're just studying, you know, Tantra or they're they're working with like an embodiment coach or a sexological body worker or, you know, that couples talk about this place of, you know, connection and change in their relationships that they've never had before. I know I've worked with some couples on touch and just some basic tools around like eye gazing, for example, mm. which is the most, I mean, it's sort of a, a basic, you know, like a place to start. But when you tell couples, like, and I see this all the time, that's why it's so less about the big experience. It's more about the little things that couples can do. So if I tell a couple to sit there and look into each other's eyes for three minutes and I set an alarm and they're doing that, it's like they might never have done it before, maybe for 10 seconds on their first date or 20. But for three minutes and you're staring and then you realize after you look into each other's eyes, right, our breath starts to sink up and we feel that you see tears well up, you see, you know, this connection before we even get it to any of the touch, just from that practice of breath and eyes. Yeah. So couples who say just that alone and then is you're a game starting changer. from that transcendent and then you start, space and then they're already then they're in their bodies mm-hmm. and then they then they can start and some some things that people realize is that coming from another couple that I worked with you know, the woman was much more in her performative space sexually. She felt that she didn't know how to receive. And this is a big thing I hear from women that it's very hard to receive. You said this for yourself too, pleasure and to let go because so much about having pleasure and orgasm is truly a letting go and being in your body and allowing whatever comes in to release. And if you are living a life where it's about giving to people and your partner, it can be just like a challenge. So the practice of, you know, just having a couple, a woman, I I had her do this exercise of being like the bossy masseuse. And so she has to, to tell her partner specifically what she wants. He starts touching her. So they get a massage table and he touches her. And this is actually a practice that a, a, a sexological body worker named Dolly Josette did with me. And so this, First, the practice of teaching a woman, and it could be a man too, but 
saying to herself, like, you have to tell your partner in this moment on the table what you like and what you don't like. And if your whole life has been around, that feels good. Whatever you're doing feels good. So to see them go through this, like, I can't do it. I can't. I don't know what I want. Because there is a point where if you've spent your whole life giving, you actually don't even know what you like. You don't know how to receive. So that process of, like, the anger and and people feeling like, I can't do this. But then breathing. It's always about breathing and being present. And then being able to say, I don't like the way you touch me there. That has never felt good to me could you please go slower and then actually seeing her get into her like her rage kind of rage around it too but then power and the becoming more embodied and her being able to after about 15 minutes say exactly what she liked Mm. like saying like I've actually never liked the way you've done this thing but I really want you to kiss my neck slowly I want you to slow down with your the way you're touching my you know inner elbow because we also have these exercises of touching for your pleasure where you close your eyes and your partner touches you and then you touch that you know so closing your eyes and allow being able to give feedback and take take in so i would just say with couples these basic embodiment connecting processes practices help them more than any other sex tip that they can get is learning to be in their body Mm. This feels so big. So this is actually <laughs> called the bossy masseuse. Yeah. But it's actually the massage, the receiver the, of the massage. Yeah, the, right. Yeah, the bossy massage. I love that. <laughs> and I love this so much because even in teaching manifesting, so many people say to me, Emily, I don't know what I want. Mm. I, lo- I would love to manifest, but I don't know what I want. And I oftentimes will say like, hey, how in touch with your sexual desire are you? Because I find that once, and, and this is for all genders, but I find especially women, is that if they don't know what they want sexually, then it's very hard for them to know what they want in their lives. Yes. And like you said, they've become so good at serving and doing and pleasing and taking care of everyone else that they've really forgotten to ask themselves yeah. what they want like in their lives or in their bodies. Yeah. And I've found that like once they start to tune into actually, I don't want to have sex tonight. Actually, I do want you to slow down. Actually, you know, whatever it is, then we become, it's almost like we des- we believe that we deserve the desire in our mm-hmm. lives. Like we're willing to name that external desire as well. Yeah. But that's tough when you're being a CEO and a mom and a and a partner and, and you've been conditioned to think that your job is to please everyone yeah. else. Mm-hmm. So as I was coming in and preparing for this interview, there was three things that kind of like societally that selfishly I want and I think that if I if they existed, I personally would be having better sex and then the world would be having okay. better, smarter sex. And they are safety, consent, and then the ability to turn yourself on. Mm. So when I think about like, you know, just I look around, I'm like, I don't think people feel safe sexually. Um, I I'd say men and women, all genders, really, certainly mm-hmm. trans people, certainly non-binary people, like not that many people feel safe sexually. And then because that's created this sort of predatory sexual Mm -hmm. society, certainly women feel like they are being preyed upon. And then there's this like shutdown and then and then it just proliferates the prey and predator cycle. (sighs) Yes. And then consent. Like I'm so grateful that like the teenagers and people in their 20s are talking about consent now. But I was in my 40s -hmm. before it became like consent was like a part of my dialogue Mm -hmm. and my culture. Yeah. Like to even stop to be like do I want to touch myself? Yeah. Does my pussy want to be touched right now? Like, and and I imagine that that's probably still kind of a far off idea for a lot of oh, people that you could say no. You could say no to your husband. Mm-hmm. You could say no to your boyfriend. And that first we have to check in with consent with ourselves mm-hmm. and then turning ourselves on. So I know that those are three really yeah, big those topics. Are big topics. They're all great. I mean, there's um, so much to say about them. But uh, so let's start with safety. Like, okay. how do you feel like, how would smarter sex help us to create a culture of safety mm. around sex. And and that means like safe to express, safe to express desires, safe to be in your turn on. Because mm. um, I think so many men are afraid, well, I don't want to go after someone because I don't want to be perceived as a predator. I don't want to be in my sexual energy because I don't want someone to feel afraid of me. Mm-hmm. And then I see women not wanting to be their sexual energy because they don't want it to be taken advantage of or preyed upon. And like all of this is moving <sighs> us away from the goal. Mm-hmm. So how would you say we reverse that and move into a space mm. of sexual safety? So. Safety is a, is a huge component of having smarter, healthier sex. And in fact, when we feel safe, we are able to have more pleasure and more orgasms and all that. So it really is an important cornerstone of your sexual health. And so safety is like, is so like, and, and there are so many, there's the, just the, am I with a person that makes me feel good? Do I trust this person? I mean, we're always hearing of people in toxic relationships and is this person going to stay and go and stay or go? And we feel like we're addicted to something that's unhealthy and we definitely don't feel safe. 
So those kind of relationships, if we can just ask ourselves, do I feel safe with this person? Is it someone that I feel like has my heart, will respect my body, Mm. will make me feel good, cares about my pleasure? So I think that these are really important questions to ask yourself about either whether you're manifesting a new relationship or it's a relationship you're in or somebody you're dating do you trust this person? Mm-hmm. And and you'd find that like most people would think, oh, of course I would trust the person I'm with, but there's a lot of people who don't or they're mm-hmm. in a relationship where they're like, I don't know if this person's going to cheat or if they're going to actually say what they said they're going to do. Mm. People who don't follow through on their promises to you. You know, even if they're always late or not great with money, like there's play, a lot of different areas that safety can come into play. Mm-hmm. And if we taught sex education in a meaningful way that is more holistic and accurate because a lot of the sex ed we teach especially in the united states if we teach it at all isn't even accurate Mm. so you back all that up but we're empowering young people when they're learning about sex with the truth about sex that it isn't just about stis and getting pregnant but it's about like a deep pleasure and then going into consent like consent feels this has gotten this bad rap like okay now we're teaching consent am i supposed to like you know make before i make out with someone like is this okay can i touch you like that's such a buzzkill But the thing about consent is that also lends itself to so much safety. Because if you have consent by someone, you feel safe. You could say, can I kiss you? You know, or you could say like, God, I keep thinking about kissing you. And how would that feel to you? Like it's all in the delivery and the way you say it. Like I can't stop thinking about what it would be like for my lips to be on your lips. Like how does that sound to you? You can make consent sexy. So, right? Let's make a t-shirt. Make consent (laughs) sexy again. Yeah. And even accelerated consent, mm -hmm. right? Like that you're like okay, just because I'll let you touch my arm does not mean you can kiss my neck. And so so it's like, if you're going to keep asking, if each new thing we want to check in on, we, we better make it sexy or that it is going to be a buzzkill. And I love what you just said of like, how would you feel about that? Mm-hmm. Which is, I love like, can I kiss you is sort of like extracting, right? It's like, can I do something to you is a different question than like, would you love to be kissed right now? Yeah. How did that feel? Yeah. yeah. Is your body, what's your body say to that? Like, is yeah. that hell yes, hell no? And, and I love the building consent slowly. Like, that's just a hot thing to do. And it's also a great practice. Because if people are listening, they're like, oh, I, I, I'm already in this place. Our sex life is already kind of rote. So we do the same thing. Take intercourse off the table. Take penetration, whatever you're doing, and start slow again. Kiss each other. Before you move to any other area, say, how would you feel if I, you know, how would it feel if I took your shirt off? How would it feel if I, you know, slowly addressed you? How would you feel if I went down on you? I mean, like, that is just so hot. Mm -hmm. And it's that slowness Mm -hmm. around sex that I really think where a lot of us can find our turn-ons. Because for many of us, and I know for myself too, in the past, it sex moves so quickly. Because being with male partners, they it escalates because they get their erection and they're ready to go. And if you understand anything about female sexuality is that, you know, it our sexual energy takes, you know, there's a there's there's steps, there's a process and there's takes a while to build to feel to feel this safe, to feel that do I actually want this? Is this a yes? Is it a no? But in our culture, it's like he's ready, then I gotta be ready. Yes. So there's been such a fastness to sex. So I think like slow sex even going five times slower than you usually do, just remembering that could be such a game changer for your eroticism. And then Mm. that would lead to turning ourselves on. I mean, if we can't turn ourselves on, how is anybody else going to be able to step into that role? Mm -hmm. And that is probably the most important work we can do. Well, I want to like bridge these two topics because I feel like the consent, you know, obviously is connected to safety because you're checking in. And I love the way you're framing it of like, how would that feel to you? Because then the person receiving has to really check in. be Like, do I want that? How would it feel? It's not just yes or no. Oh, it would feel a little scary, but I'm, I, but let's do it. Oh, it feels a little naughty or it feels like uh, exciting and please do it. Like, but you're checking in with yourself, which is creating more and more mm-hmm. safety. Um, but then I also feel that how it connects to turning yourself on is that if you think that there's something wrong with you because your partner is a different gender than you and they get turned on faster than you and you get turned on slower than them that I've seen for myself and in so many of my students that you think, oh, well, I'm broken. There's something wrong with me. I'm slow. And it's like, no, you're not slow. You're just slower than this other species. (laughs) Yeah, that's it. (laughs) 
<laughs> and so it's like, how do you find, and, and maybe this goes into turning ourselves on, um, but how do we bridge that gap? Because I learned from Layla that, that like on average, women take about 45 minutes to be in like their full turned yeah. on state mm -hmm. and men take about 15. Mm -hmm. So there's at least a 30 minute differential there. And 30 minutes is a long time, especially you're on the clock, the babysitter's leaving, the exactly. whatever. So how do we shorten that gap and do we do that by turning ourselves on? Oh, yeah, that that is the that is the question. That is the magic question because, and this is where we get into. I always call it the orgasm gap, and it's um, but it's not even about orgasm. It's like the arousal gap, mm -hmm. and that is a real. And most people don't really know these numbers at all. I don't know these these stats, but that's actually like, if and again, if people understood that, they wouldn't feel so you know bad about themselves they would mm -hmm. they would understand like this is just like what we got to do to get there yeah so i think part of it is redefining what sex means to you and mm. intimacy so in our culture when you say did you have sex with someone they <laughs> think penis goes into vagina penetration but for the majority of vulva owners they are going to they're not going to have their most pleasure from anything having to do with the penis at all sorry guys it's true <laughs> most of them are going to have the most pleasure from a mouth or fingers or a toy and so just understanding that process that it's going to take a little bit of time and that maybe we take penetration off the table it's about touch it's about massage it's about you know eye gazing or sitting together breathing together so i think that once we understand what is going to get get us turned on and get into our bodies then we can start to incorporate that practice yeah like into our into our sex life mm -hmm. so the challenge is like what you're saying is that it depends what your goal of sex is like if mm -hmm. it's for orgasm then bring a toy out like that might that's going to shorten it or you know get your partner off and then you can do your thing because you just want you want to have an orgasm and you want to have a release like there's zero things wrong with that but if you want to have a truly like sexual experience that that is going the distance and you're in your full arousal i think we have to all be realistic that it might not happen every day and every time you have sex so when i talk about so maybe making time for that and and also just understanding like what 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 you need like if it is like oral sex or it starts in the morning and you finish in the evening so all day mm. you have this energy building through your body like that could be incredible like, I love sort of living in that space of eroticism and not just like hitting and quitting it which is what most of us are doing mm -hmm. so I think that that's that's part of it is just to, oh so I say define it like for many people they think they're craving sex or maybe many men are like, I do want sex. What are you kidding? But for so many of us, especially if you have a vulva, it might be about, I want to be massaged. Like I know mm. for me and my partner knows that if I, like if he massages me for like 10, 15 minutes, like that's going to be a game. Like that's going to get me more in my body. I might not have wanted sex 10 minutes ago, but at least now I want something. Like I yeah. want to touch and I want to connect. And that might be sex for us or Maybe it's mutual masturbation if you don't have a lot of time, but you're both getting off. That is like one of my favorite Me things. Me too. I love it. I love it. There's no pressure. There's no penetration. We know it's a sure thing. It's super hot to look at your partner and your partner to see you in ecstasy. Yeah. So like. Wait, so why is that? Like, because I think I have a judgment uh, and I didn't think I realized until right now. I think I have a judgment of myself that that there's something maybe wrong with me mm. or that like why is it that it's easier or faster to pleasure yourself than it is for someone else to pleasure you? like why is mutual masturbation like you said it's like a guarantee it's like mm -hmm. a sure thing it's faster like you just named those things as if they were givens yeah um then like having a like a mutually shared experience with someone well i think because we we know our parts i mean everything is a um it's like immediate uh, feedback it's immediate feedback but we there's such a um it's like the neural pathways, right? Like in our brain and in our body. Like I know how to touch myself. I know what it takes. I know how to move. I know how to moan. And we've been doing this for a long time. Mm -hmm. However long we've been pleasing ourselves. I know exactly what needs to happen. I don't have to co-create anything here. So the second, the time you bring someone else into the picture, well, then it's like both of your energies. You have to make sure you're on the same page, that your partner's not still on the thinking about work and that you're you still you know that you're still in your body so that's two people coming together that we have to kind of get to that I want to say equal or get to the same place so that just takes more time and we can't even no matter how embodied we are and how present I might still be thinking about 
how my body looks right now. Does my partner really like the way I'm touching them? Does this feel good to them? I'm a little bit uncomfortable here. Should I move? So there's so many other factors when you're together with somebody that mm -hmm. that it is just always a little bit harder. Now, couples who've been together a long time, they might kind of get into the routines and they know what they, they need. But I think on our own, there's just like a freedom and there's a, you know, it's it's our we're literally taking our pleasure into our own hands in that moment. So mm -hmm. I just think it's a lot, you know, it's a lot easier and it's a lot, you know, we don't have to like, even though we're trying not to, we are always mindful and maybe perhaps even worried about our partner's experience as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but thank you for alle alleviating any <laughs> self-judgment oh, there. Please that don't. it's like, fat, that there's something wrong, ah. that like pleasuring myself, like why is that faster? Like, you know, that's just a normal, natural thing. Yeah, no, okay. it's so normal, it's so natural. I mean, because those stats of the 45 minutes, like to get into your full energy, that's a little bit different than just like, I can sit down and probably have an orgasm in 10, 15 minutes if it's just me. And that is the mm -hmm. most normal thing in the world. Okay. Um, yeah, Great. common. So I think I took us off. because. I, so let's go back to turning yourself on. Because I know this is a big topic and something that I think if everyone hmm, had more tools to turn themselves on energetically, emotionally, imaginationally, if that's even a word, <laughs> that it would take some of the pressure off of the other person yes. and off of the relationship. So how do we get better at turning ourselves on? Mm. Well, first, we are responsible for our own pleasure. We're responsible for our own orgasms. We're responsible for our own erotic energy. Our own, like That's on us. And so once we realize it, and the reason why I'm saying that, maybe why that I hold that point so near and dear to my heart, because I used to think that it was my partner's job to do something to me, to bring it to me, to make me orgasm. And then I, you know, realize like, no, I actually have to make sure that my brain is on board, that my body's there, that I know, you know, how to turn myself on. You know, here's the other thing about having a vulva. If you have a penis, your body and your sexuality and your masturbation practice has been celebrated. We've all seen men, male masturbation scenes or we know he's going to masturbate or he's going to get off. And like, it's such a thing like male sexuality, but female sexuality has sort of been in the dark so much of it that, you know, basically the vagina, the vulva has really bad PR. It's sort of shameful. It doesn't occur to women as much as it does to men. And I don't know if we go back to the biology, is it because the penis is on the outside because they're always touching it? I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why. Just patriarchy, patriarchy and shame and tens well, of thousands of years of conditioning patriarchy. from the church. And well, I was going to say that's the <laughs> penetration part too. Like mm -hmm. sex, there's nowhere if you go back in time that it was all about penetration and making babies. But if we look at like the impact of, of patriarchy and religion, it's that you should only have sex to procreate. So that's why we all have to get into this, uh, 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 this missionary position that feels good to not make people I mean a little bit but that's not where the magic is so learning our it's almost like I'm asking people to create their own owner's manual for your body mm -hmm. what actual what touch feels good to me what does turn me on what kind of touch and I'm not just talking about your genitals and so I talk a lot about mindful masturbation um, and that is really just the process of like slowing down and without the goal of orgasm just the goal of exploration what actually feels good to me and this is how we get the answers to inform a partner to inform our own sexuality is just like you know without using porn not like a judgment on that but just like really being in your body and starting with you know maybe your you know your arms your hands and moving your hands over your body and saying like what does where am I feeling things going back to your breath and this is where you're going to learn so much about turning yourself on mm. and, and that what takes you like time that's like making dates with yourself yes. like time on the calendar baths Dancing, all of it. Uh, lingerie, Dancing. like really dating yourself. You have to. Seducing yourself. It's, that's a big part of it. And mm -hmm. the thing is when people say they don't have time or it's why would I want to do that or that seems silly. I mean, think about everything else in our life that we deem as important. We want to be a great parent. We read parenting books. We talk to our friends. We want to be great at our job and get a raise. We do all of these things. But with sex, there's still this belief that it should just always work out. It should be magical. and It should just be our chemistry. And there's some like fairy dust that's just going to take us into this wonderful sex or land. some magical partner magical who's going to have all the keys to yeah. a door that I don't even know where the lock exactly, is. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But he's going to know. He must have the keys. And so if you look at it that way and you're someone who thinks sex is important and connection is important, well, then it's time to take yourself on a date. Like prior, put it on your calendar. Mm. Like take the time. Like I'm not asking you to like take out the trash or organize your drawer. Like I'm saying like, if you devote time to your own pleasure and your own sexuality, like 
there is just so much more to be revealed mm. and we've just reached the tip of the iceberg like we don't barely know anything about our bodies mm. as you know on this journey and i know where i was and i'm always still learning too so mm -hmm. it's like Especially being a woman, like we're so lucky. We're like covered in these nerve endings and these parts that feel so good to touch. I mean, the clitoris alone has 12,000 nerve endings. And do you know that when I was- I feel like every month we get another 2,000. It was well, eight it, and then it was 10. Now it's 12. Okay, this well, is very exciting. No, Emily, let me tell you something. So for 20 years, myself, all sex educators, people working in this field were like, clitoris is 8,000 nerve endings. Never, never doubted it. We just 8,000 nerve endings. When I was in the middle of writing Smart Sex, there was a huge study that came out that said, nope, guess what? It has 12,000 nerve endings because we're finally, finally studying female sexuality. We actually are looking at the parts. I mean, the clitoris wasn't even on the map to the late 90s. It wasn't even in medical journals. So the late I, 90s, y'all. The late y 90s. Like, like <laughs> I, mean, I didn't know that the clitoris was like this wishbone-shaped yes! thing. I thought it was just like Most the, people still like, don't. I, I was people like, think it's a little bud. Yeah. It's got legs. That, the, the nerve endings go deep inside, behind the labia. I mean, and most of us are just, if we are having orgasms, maybe we're just stimulating like 2,000 of those nerve endings. But those nerve endings are responsible in that expansion. It's responsible for blood flow and orgasm and all the things that you want. But you got to go in there and find out where they are and yeah. learn how to touch them. Amen. And stimulate them and have fun. Mm. Gosh, it's a good time. It's good homework. Well, I would say that for me, I, I also didn't prioritize my pleasure. I would not make time for it because of whatever, shame, conditioning, yeah. cultural programming, until I understood that I could hook my sexual energy up to my dreams. Like until I understood that I could use my sexual energy to manifest, I did not prioritize it. And that is embarrassing to admit, but whatever. Like I spent a whole career teaching people to meditate so they could have better sex and make more money. And so now I'm like, oh, this is the linchpin for me. So I imagine it's a linchpin for a lot of others yes. that, oh, tapping into my sexual energy actually makes me more magnetic. Mm -hmm. I can attract those jobs and more money and the person and the opportunity by turning on my magnet, mm -hmm. by turning on my hoo-ha, by increasing my electromagnetic yes. field. And so then I was like, wait, I'm going to spend as much time and energy as possible figuring this out mm -hmm. and what turns me on. And so just to share some like quick starter tips for folks, like again, like you said, no judgment on porn, but if, if all you're ever doing is using porn and vibrators, then it's just so fast, it's so intense, and it's so much stimulation. It'd be like eating sweet tarts for mm -hmm. breakfast, lunch, and dinner, yeah. and then trying to taste the sweetness in a carrot, right? A carrot's not gonna mm. taste very good if, you're, if your tongue is like saturated with candy. And so again, it's not a judgment on toys or porn, but if you just take a minute, just take a little pause, and like you said, slow down, mm -hmm. then we might discover like a whole new area, a whole new echelon, mm. a whole new like layer of ourselves, like even energetic mm -hmm. orgasm, even mental orgasm, nipple orgasm, mm. throat orgasm. Oh like it There's seems so many like, orgasms. Yeah. Like, so little time. <laughs> so many <laughs> orgasms, so little time. Yeah. No, it's true. It's like, and I love what you're saying about like sex magic and sex energy. I mean, it is true that when you live in that state, of just breathing, being in touch with your pelvic floor, like doing the, you know, the exercises, even if people know it as a kegel, but even pumping those muscles, like tensing and relaxing and just even doing that or the way you, you know, just, just moving your body in this, in those ways that allow you to feel more in touch with your energy. And the more you do that and live, live in that space and while at that same time, which is what you're talking about is thinking about your dreams and your, your manifestations, like that is the the magic right there that is the energy that is what's going to help you because if there's still a really big block because it is creative energy it's everything it's not just orgasm which i know you talk about all of this but it's like it's um it's connected so if that's people's incentive to take the time to realize that when you release that block and get more connected with your energy it's going to impact and you will get what you need, the partners you want, the dreams you want, the jobs you want, the money you want. Like it's all connected, yeah. right? So this is... And even if we took the practices out of it or like the electromagnetic field out of it and the ancient <laughs> tantric practices out of it, let's just imagine we had like two identical twins. Same height, same gender, same education, same salary, same outfit even. And one of them is like outrageously embodied, like embodying all of the pillars from the book. They are embodied, they know how to collaborate, they are turned on, they orgasmed well this morning. <laughs> and then the other one is not embodied, not physically or mentally well, does not know how to collaborate, is not in their pleasure, hasn't orgasmed or had sex in months. And they both go into a job interview. Mm. 
It's like, which one of those people do you think is going to get the job? Yeah. Right? It's like, we just want to be around people who are, are in their pleasure mm -hmm. because we are a sympathetic species. Yes. Right? Like, stress is a contagious disease, but mm -hmm. good news, so is bliss. Mm -hmm. And yes. so by you turning on this ability to tap into your own ecstasy and bliss, you are going to spread that and make that yes. contagious. Absolutely. So that I had this it. download that a few years ago okay. that was uh, Tantra for Teens. Tantra for yes. Teens. Tantra for Teens. And I was like, thank you, but I love no it. thank you. <laughs> like, not me, not now. I mean, maybe later, but because it just feels like such a hot topic. And the, I mean, just not the just logistics the alliteration, of that. But, uh, yeah. I mean, I love alliteration. <laughs> it seemed like too much of a landmine to even get near it. But for me at that time but for you like you're established enough you're respected enough mm -hmm. you are like uh, people trust you enough that I feel like if you wanted to make a tantra for teens course or like a smart sex for teens course I do wait say, so yes, one of my so, okay so we're talking about pivoting and what I want so one of my greatest passions right now is developing programs for 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 young people because well, they're our future, right? They're they're going to we're going to continue to repeat patterns unless we teach them to be more connected in their bodies. I mean, tantra. It could be. I mean, because tantra people are so a lot of people don't really understand tantra. They think it's like a and it is a massive practice, and it can mean there's so many different arms of it. But at the end of the day, it's like presence, embodiment, eye contact, breath, looking into someone's eye. So yeah, I love I love the idea. But the thing is, is they'd have to do a course before that because most teens and young people already have the shame in their bodies because when they were three years old they had a hand on their pants and someone said don't do that that's dirty or when their parents were naming their parts they said this is your this is your you know your thighs you know and your like this is your stomach and this is oh, this is your breasts maybe this is your stomach and this is your knees so they jump right over it or they call it a hoo-ha or ye yoni and it's or yeah, not be yoni we'd be glad if they did that or like your wee wee and we don't name the parts so if we don't name the parts and it's called a something else then we automatically have a judgment that there's something off here i shouldn't say it i shouldn't talk about it and this conditioning is happening at such a young age pre-verbal and so the work that has to be done, and again, this is where I'm like, ah, uh, because we, we look at countries like in the Netherlands is the only place where they teach comprehensive sex education from the time you are babies. Like they name your parts, they talk about consent, and it's literally all the time. It's every year in school, it's your parents talk to you about it, it's, it's sex with pleasure. They talk about pleasure and orgasm. So anyway, going back to teens, it's like, and I found in the work I've done with teens, because I have been dabbling lately and doing a lot, like they just still, and this is what keeps me going, they almost know less than we knew at our age, you know, whenever we were in our teens because of porn. So now we've brought porn into the mix and porn without sex education is a disaster mm. because now they're thinking that sex and they're like, well, I don't know what sex actually is. If, it, if it's not porn, what is it? So, yeah, but I love mindfulness tantra. I mean, have you've done courses, right? Meditation courses for for teens. Yeah, I've heard kids. Yeah, so I have Ziva Kids Just, and it's amazing and fun and we worked with folks from Sesame Street and child psychologists from Harvard and wow. it was actually a big thing for me because I was like, I can't have a Ziva Kids program and teach sac sacred secret. Like I can't teach sacred sexuality <laughs> and have a kids training, which is my own yeah, conditioning and shame. Right. And I was like, but in the Netherlands they're Teaching. They're the only place. Like all the sex educators I know, sex, we go over there. We're like trying to study like how do we bring it here? But like it's so institutional. Like we, if we look at like rolling back rights now, like what's happening with Roe v. Wade and then there's all these states that you can't even get an abortion or sex education. Like literally only like 17 states require sex ed to be medically accurate in the state. So like it's not going to go into the schools. And so it has to be just some kind of programs where parents have to opt in. Yes. So Tantra, not to get into the weeds here, but like that might be like, oh, whoa, I don't even know Tantra. Tantra. So, but there is something with youth that I think is going to be, I guess, pivotal and game changer for many kids who are still going off to college or just having sex and not really understanding it. Or they're sitting in their rooms masturbating and feeling shame about it. Because shame, I talk in my book about the pleasure thieves. And I talk about the three things that are keeping us from pleasure is stress, trauma, and shame. Those are the things. And so we can learn to work with our shame, release our shame. I don't think we ever get rid of it. It's a heady stew, right? But how do we even just even recognize that I have shame? Like that's the thing. Like I'm still feeling bad that I'm touching myself because I grew up in a home where it wasn't okay. So there's a lot of different layers to it, but 
you know. But where do we think that shame comes from? And and so I just, Leila and I went to Greece this summer and we went on this priestess pilgrimage and we were in Crete and Eleusis and Delphi and in these ancient sites where these priestesses were serving medicine and also doing fertility rituals. And, and it was really liberating to me to be in a physical location where stadiums and <sighs> temples were built in reverence, one, to women, mm. and two, to the visceral experience of God that we can get through plant medicine and through pleasure that is not available at talking about God or someone telling you that God is a white man with a beard judging mm. you that you're going to go to hell for masturbating. Yeah. Like that is an experience of the divine that is not available to us. Yeah. And we think that when we think of God as like a judgy, shameful God yeah. and that our bodies are somehow filled with sin and something wrong. And so I'm, I'm fascinated. So, I mean, there's the obvious like religious conditioning that happens, but Beyond that, like, okay. where do you think the shame is coming from? Okay, so beyond religious shame? <laughs> I mean, I know that's a big I mean, that's, a like, that's almost like a, yes. But no, but that is, okay, so that's a big one. That's just like our society where we, you might not even be grown up like in a religious home. Like, I grew up Jewish. We didn't have a lot of, um, I didn't, I wasn't told like I was sinning if I touched myself or I had sex, but I still had the absence of information, right? Mm -hmm. So It's like lying by omission. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. so I, I didn't have information about it, but I, I also didn't have, have have the shame. So that's part of it. The shame also comes from from perhaps somebody might have said something negative about our body once. Mm -hmm. Once. Like I can't tell you how many people I hear they're like, oh, some guy told me once that I was really bad at oral sex. Um, and now I can't ever perform oral sex, receive oral sex because of that. So I feel like I'm a bad lover. Like mm. that stuff sticks, sticks with us because we don't talk about sex ever again, mm. going back to that. So then we hold on to that. Maybe we're comparing ourselves to what we see in porn and social media and we think our bodies don't match up to that. Something's wrong with my labia. Something's wrong with my body. So then we have shame around that. We also just have shame because women have been so judged and persecuted for being sexual. You know, I hear from a lot of women who are like, I get to the point of orgasm, but I can't let go. It's because somewhere in their psyche, even if it wasn't told to them, who knows if it's like ancestral, they're feeling like if I release right now, that's like a bad thing for me to lose control and have an orgasm. I don't deserve pleasure. Mm. And you don't want to be seen as easy or a slut or whatever words we're using in our culture that are still prevalent right now like it's still it's still so pervasive that if a woman you know that men can be out there sleeping together i mean again we've come a long way it is changing right now especially in our worlds like that's not a thing but if you go to like other parts of the world um there's definitely a problem with being sexual so we just never feel okay with it so there's shame in that there's mm -hmm. i mean the shame is i think one of the most i think it's probably one of the hardest that one of the biggest uh, pleasure thieves that gets in our way because it's so insidious mm -hmm. I think we don't even we don't even like we can't really like touch it or see it but the more like you get into it you get to look at yourself and say like you know what I help people work with this shame is like like where did that message come from yes. like somebody literally took that message and planted it in my said brain but who it, said who like it no longer serves me so then rewriting our own sexual manual and our sexual history and so I love that you do that. Thank you for that. And so that's what I was going to ask. What is the antidote to shame? So when you're working with people on these pleasure thieves, especially when we're robbing from ourselves with our own shame or the, you know, cultural program shame, how do you help people to transmute that or to love it? I mean, I think, well, I think the antidote to shame is what are they, is like, I think it's, it's pleasure or presence, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, um, like authenticity. And so really just getting people to, so how I work with them is saying like, what what are the messages? Like journal, like write down all the things that you might believe about sex. Like I'm not worthy of pleasure. I don't like my body. Um, I'm going to go to hell. And you write it all down. And then you get to like flip the script. I have an exercise in the book called Flip the Script. And then you get to say like, what if that wasn't true? And you flip that and you think like, what do you want? I mean, it's a lot of the stuff that you can do in other spiritual practices. But when you look at that, so that's like the written part. Like I am a sexual goddess deserving of pleasure and 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 you know, connection. I and my body is beautiful and um, has so much capacity for pleasure. I will, I am, you know, in a, 
you know, I have a relationship that's filled with love, consent, and, you know, joy. Like just the affirmations are a really important part of it. The other thing is like surrounding yourself with sex positive voices. Like I think the reason why Sex with Emily, my podcast has such longevity and why people listen to it, one of the reasons, and I used to, and I didn't get this before, but I would always, since the beginning, I heard from people who were like, I was on a road trip and I listened to your podcast for 12 hours with my boyfriend. And I'm like, that's a long time to listen to a podcast, you know, like why? And I would hear that and it's because I think when you hear sex positive voices, so for example, listening to my podcast allows people to see that there is a way to talk about sex that is free of shame, yes. free of judgment, yes. you know, and that you can actually like ask for what you want and get it. So I think like rewiring like our notions around sex. And so I think surrounding yourself with sex positive voices, following the people that make you feel good on social media and unfollowing the people that make you feel bad, practicing talking about sex, practice with your best friend. I mean, again, we talk about it all the time. I'm sure we went to dinner, we talk about it. But again, unfortunately, most people don't. They're mm. not talking about it with their friends. They're not talking. I mean, don't you have friends that you haven't, maybe you don't, but friends that you've never really talked about it with? Yeah, that's true. Right? I mean, yeah. or like be that friend in your friend group that says, hey, I heard this podcast today. Like, what do you think about that? So the more we can start to like rewire, it's basically you're rewiring mm. the shame. And mm -hmm. then noticing when it comes up and like, this is no longer, this is no longer mine. This doesn't serve me. So those are some of the practices. Yeah, that feels great. And I love the idea of uh, like surrounding ourselves with sex positive voices or voices that make you feel however you want to feel. However you want to feel. Like if you want more shame, then great, get in there. Good. <laughs> but like if you don't want shame, then make sure that you are connecting to people that have either transmuted it mm -hmm. or didn't have it to begin with or that are vibrating at a frequency that you desire to yeah. vibrate at. Find those people, find mm -hmm. your circle, right? Like. Yeah, find, find the like-minded people because they're there. They're yeah. in every city. They're in every place you are, but we just have to find them. Maybe that's people's intention right now just to be like, I want to surround myself with people who want to feel good. Especially in the age of apps and, you know, with like polyamory and non-monogamy and gender fluidity. Like there's so, it's such a vast world now where things are much more specialized, where there are, I won't even say choices, but like more acceptance of, of really the spectrum mm -hmm. of both gender identity and sexual preferences. And I yeah. think inside of that is also a spectrum of monogamy. There's a spectrum of um, sex positivity. So I think it is, we are really entering a, a, We're entering a phase it. We are. where it's like you can find your niche. Mm -hmm. But then I think the challenge might be to not become like in a silo or an echo chamber, you know, because like we're always learning from other, mm -hmm. other people. Yeah. Um, what's been like the edgiest thing for you like emotionally like have you ever found either in your own practice or working with folks where you're like oh that it took me like I walked right up to an edge that I didn't know that I could cross mm. um but then I like expanded into some new version of me yeah oh my god there's so many I think every day there's examples of it from I'll think of my own in a minute I'm sure that I know that there are but for some people it's really just I never thought that I could even just I mean, this isn't going to be edgy for people, but like I never thought that I could even ask for what I want. I never thought I could have an orgasm that way. I never thought I could ask my partner to open up the relationship after 20 years. I never thought they would. And so I've definitely, you know, worked with people, helping them opening up, asking for what they want, you know, telling a partner they're bisexual or telling a partner that, you know, that they desire something else or they have this fetish. Um, and so to me, that stuff is always really incredible and I guess edgy to feel like you are in one place, but you can actually like most people hear things like open relationships or threesomes or, you know, full body orgasms are like not mine, not me. Sounds cool. Like that could never happen. But when people start to realize that, like everything's possible, like there's no sex police that are going to knock on your door and be like, I heard it. You're practicing in this way like that. We get to decide like we are responsible. We are in charge. So I think that that's, you know, really, really empowering. And I think and edgy for many people like edgy just to even talk about sex can be edgy i love that everything is possible everything we is possible. are in charge of our own ecstasy yes, and turn on are. and there is no sex police there's no sex police <laughs> they're like um hello i heard that you were having multiple orgasms i heard you were having you know sex you were having a threesome or you are not in a monogamous yeah, the only thing to be knocking on your door is like opportunities exactly. money friends more lovers right that's it like <laughs> literally that's it everything I you mean, want so it's just like and and so i do love that more people are open opening up and talking about it. it still is a little bit there is still shame around it I know people that are like oh but I could never tell my neighbors or my boss or my mother that I'm open or I'm in a throuple 
But the fact is that we're talking about it more and we're getting there. And I think we are closer because mm-hmm. the thing is, and the, the other thing is that the people who are monogamous, there's like a threat, right? And the point is that most people that we know are probably going to be in monogamy and they might be happy in it. And that's fine. I'm not talking about everybody should be in a throuple. But what I love about the, where the world is going now is that people just realize that they have choices, yeah. that there's an opportunity. You don't have to go into this little box and be in a perfectly monogamous relationship if it doesn't work for you. So I always had this sense, and this kind of started me on my path, that monogamy and um, a committed relationship and being with one person just always seemed like a challenge. So part of my starting sex with Emily was like, I got to find out what's wrong with me, and I got to find out what everyone else is doing to be in these happy monogamous relationships. And I've even tried it, and then I realized, though, so what I've come back to now is like a knowing that like actually I was kind of right that more of an openness, a fluid relationship where we talk about everything and we explore and expand together. Like I have a partner, but it's we get to define what it looks like and it's just yeah. a little bit different. And like I was like, I knew this when I was 19. But coming back, and I think the world's ready. I'm ready. And I think I still struggle with it though because I think I still – all right, I mean, I'm getting on the other side of it, but I kept thinking like I should still fit myself into this box. I should still mm-hmm. probably, like there still is a happily ever after and that does look like one partner. If one I could person just fit something about myself or find the perfect person, yeah, then that's I would it. be happy It's probably about the person, but no, it's about who I am and like yeah. accepting that. So. Amen, good for you. Thank you. And, and just like the <laughs> idea that it seems absurd that we would have, um, like if you and I ever start a business together, right? Like our podcast merge, Ziva and Sex with Emily merge <laughs> somehow, like we would make our own contract. Yeah. One of us would draft it, the other one would revise it. We would go through, we'd maybe do a couple round of business, maybe run it by our friend or a lawyer, an advisor, yep. and then we'd eventually get to a place where we either decide to sign it or yeah. not. Like that's a business contract. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so like the idea that would be like, oh, Emily and Emily are gonna go to business together. Here's <laughs> business contract, you know, just like the standard yeah. business contract. And then this is, this is so absurd. And yet that's what we're doing with our marriages and All our relationships. Time. We never re-examine that contract. And we don't even know there's another menu. No, we don't. We know nothing. That, that's the other thing I believe with my work is like people don't even know what's on the menu when it comes to sex. Like I can have a nipple orgasm. Yes, you can have a nipple orgasm. Yes, have a you can have orgasms. a nipple orgasm like, and it's amazing. It's amazing. I have a nipple. Like try it. But most people don't try because they're just rubbing one out, right? Like rubbing their clit. Nothing wrong with that. But like explore. Regina calls that a crotch sneeze. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Oh my God, I've heard that. That is that is amazing. So it's like, so, but then that also makes you wouldn't feel bad because like I'm only crotch sneezing. No, like you have so much to explore and play with. But it's yeah, still a miracle. It's still a miracle. It's a fucking miracle. It yes. is true. But the thing is, yeah, why don't we reevaluate our marriage contract every five years, every year to have a contract? This is what we want until it doesn't, until we don't. Or even when we're going into the relationship, yes. defining oh it God. on the front end we of like, e- this is what I'm available for. This is what I'm not available for. What would you desire? Like, we don't even have those conversations. It's just like, oh, I am keep searching for the person that's supposed to fit this one mold of business contract or yeah. relationship contract exactly it, yeah. it, it just it really it doesn't mean and it's not working for for many people i think yeah so there's a lot of unhappiness in relationships because we think this is just my lot in life i signed up for it mm-hmm. we got kids and the whole thing but mm-hmm. you know i guess you know i always say like find a partner who has a growth mindset around sex but have just a partner who has a growth mindset period <laughs> just period yeah uh, my partner adam calls it uh, expansive sacred union <sighs> So for us, the thing that works is like we are each other's primary partners and this is our sacred union and this is our priority and but it can expand or contract like it is there are moments where it expands and there are moments where the container contracts um, and that feels really good to me. I just love that like that particular term has felt really good for us. Yeah, Yeah. I love that. I'm so glad you shared that because we need them. I mean, this is happening now in real time that Mm -hmm. people are exploring. So I love that. Like you get to, but then it comes down to people are like, oh, but I could never, that would be, I can't imagine my partner being with someone, all that. But if you are looking to explore it, I mean, also it takes work. It takes time to communicate. Sure it's all process. communication, right? People think that you're just having sex all the time. Maybe you get to that point, but there's a lot <laughs> it's of A couple months of processing before <laughs> you ever get to anything else. Do not jump into the open kind of relationship until you process it. And then afterwards, you got to process it afterwards. Oh God, like, and honestly, that's like the real, I think that's the real question mark yes. for me is like, is it worth the time investment <laughs> that it takes to process exactly. front and back end? Like, I kind of like being in this monogamy thing because we never yeah. talked. <laughs> then you, right? It's true. And you have time like, to write a book, yeah, raise a kid, start a company. Things. But like, with this stuff, it's it's a lot, and then it, it but it's so it's so affronting, but it's so great because it's challenging. Like, you know, it allows you to look at parts of yourself that you might not have that obviously are going to also impact again every area of your life. Rather than blindly signing up for something without talking about it, we need to, yeah. 
Yeah. And I think it depends on why you think relationships exist. Like I think relationships exist to teach us our lessons and mm -hmm. it's a syllabus and it can yes. be some of the most profound medicine work you can ever do. <laughs> and so if you do have a growth mindset, then sometimes openness or expansive sacred union can sort of accelerate that learning because you're going to get those lessons. You're going to get those shadows. You're yeah. going to get those triggers. You're going to get that shame, that guilt, <sighs> that insecurity, the jealousy, like all that's all those like shadow sides are going to make themselves known intensely and quickly often. Yeah. And if you judge that as bad, then you're like, no, no, thank you, not for me. But if you're like, oh, I see that as an expediation of the curriculum mm. or an intensifying of the curriculum, and I can use this as a path to transmute that and integrate this into wholeness, then it can really elevate it. But that is certainly like a personal decision. Yeah. Like I'm not going to throw someone who doesn't want to into an ayahuasca ceremony. Yeah. You no, know, like exactly. that has to be consensual. There's so much work to be done before you get there, but yeah. it, it is possible. I love that relationships are a syllabus. That's such a great way Isn't of saying it because it's so true. Yeah. Like I'm and you can graduate. My, yeah. You can you can learn the lesson and graduate, and that's okay. It doesn't mean it failed. Yeah, it's not a. Oh, that's the other thing. Can we just change that? A relationship ends is not a failure. Ugh. Like that growth work was done, and you're going to learn in another relationship. It's yeah. just these are just all the things that we just have to. People would feel so much better if they could. I think they're doing that. I love your podcast. We're going to all learn that that we can all define our own kinds of relationships that feels mm. right for us. So I just wish people would just start. Talking yeah, like, about it more, read the and then book, not judge take their the course. friends for having the thing, because like, we still are really like judgy of people's sex life. Because I think also when you hear people monogamous relationships, like, oh, how could you ever do that? We're so afraid. Like, let's say we decide to have an, a different kind of relationship. Well, what are the monogamous people going to say? Because a lot of times they're not even in touch with their maybe their own discomfort, so that they're projecting like you should be married, you should do it our way. That's the wrong way. Like there is no right or wrong when it comes to any of this stuff. I mean, it should be consensual and it should be pleasurable, but otherwise like we get to decide who, what we want. Amen. How exciting is that? It is so exciting. I know. What a great time to be alive. And that's how I feel about like <laughs> trans people, non-binary people, like gender non-conforming, the, the whole spectrum of sexual preferences where it's like, what a gift to be alive in a time where we get to meet so many different types of the divine. Yes. Like to see so many different faces of God versus just like, oh, there's this and there's that, right? There's black and there's white. Yeah. And so I feel excited about that. I too. Um, what? Mm, mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> yep. Sex and psychedelics. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I know mm. that you've done some journeys on this. You've had some experience. I've done a little bit, but most of my experience with psychedelics has been on my own. And then I've had some incredible experience with partners, but I haven't been on like a... That's not true. I've gone on like one led journey, but not about sexuality. But I do think that that they're so closely related sexual energy and what plant medicine like, you know, psilocybin or LSD or there's a lot of other things like, you know, that you could do that could really be even even cannabis can help you be more in your body and not in mm -hmm. your head. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why I love it, I mean, there's so many reasons why. And I love that it's becoming decriminalized in so many places is because if I look at the blocks, like I go into like reverse engineer it. Okay. One of the top questions I get asked is why am I so disasso disassociated during sex? Why can't I have an orgasm? Why am I so blocked? Why can't I? Da, da, da. But it's like, that's anxiety. Like that's chatter in your brain. That's distraction and pleasure and anxiety can't live in the same moment because mm -hmm. pleasure needs presence, right? So if you're anxious and worried, like it, right? Like you can't have like the spike in cortisol and the spike in your arousal. So I, I think that plant medicine, psychedelics help people become more embodied, release a lot of this shame and the old stories and truly feel what they're feeling in the moment. So I just think, and it's so tidy, like your sexual energy, you can access it more easily, readily. So I just think that there, and that's initially, right, the beginning of plant medicine, right, was like, you know, women helping other women and helping everyone, right, in their, in their society feel more, be closer to God, feel more connected to their bodies and their community. And so that's sex, like that's mm. sexuality. So, and I know there are, yeah, movements, you've done more of this, but I think that that's, that is going to be a big um, antidote to the disassociation, which is a huge problem. And is the yeah. disassociation coming from trauma, from shame, Everything. conditioning? So the disassociation for sex comes from, tr yes, <laughs> trauma, shame, worry, like it could be sexual assault, trauma, of course, that's going to have your body into freeze mode and can be really hard to receive. I mean, there's so many people, you know, more women than men that feel that they actually can't feel during sex. They're numb. 
they like I don't know if anything was inside like I don't feel it or they leave there they leave the room they're like above themselves watching themselves that could be trauma that could just be anxiety like you're constantly in a state of you could be worried about the kids hearing or the you know finishing that email to your boss it's like stress trauma shame really those are the things I think that's allowing us to dissociate I shouldn't be having the sex right now I'm really ashamed by the way my body looks I don't like my thighs rubbing together I don't like how I look naked those are the thoughts that are running through people's head that is preventing them and this is all genders from being present so I love the idea of using psychedelics to help people be more in touch Mm -hmm. with their sexual energy Mm -hmm. and and certainly different medicines will do different things but like ketamine we know can really increase neuroplasticity and especially ketamine assisted therapy can like really rewire things pretty quickly and i've just recently learned you do not have to get off of ssris in order to do ketamine assisted therapy which i think you do with mdma Mm -hmm. and so you know for a lot of i have like two really close people in my life who wanted to do mdma assisted therapy but they would have to wean off their ssris for eight weeks yeah and they were both moms and they tried it for like three or four weeks and they were like, I can't be around yeah. my kids. Like they did not trust themselves with the children yeah. off of SSRIs. And so it like prevented them from even being able to get to the MDMA therapy. And so just letting people know, like I, I think. Oh, I love that ketamine. I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize that because that is a barrier to go off your, your medications mm-hmm. for sure. And I think with psilocybin as well, but obviously you have to check your legal and your state and obviously check with your doctor. I'm not a doctor, but um, I know that will come as a surprise to no one, but I've done a lot of personal and professional research on sex and psychedelics. So it's, it feels like an exciting time it's a really, yeah. to where we can start to have our own visceral experience of the divine, like mm-hmm. through plant medicine, through sexuality, sometimes with them together and how they might play with each other. Right, that we mm-hmm. get this neuroplasticity and this healing that can happen in the psychedelic space. We get the neuroplasticity and pleasure and rewiring and transmutation that can happen in the sexual space. Mm-hmm. And then when those start to dance with each other, I think we really can expedite and accelerate yes. not only the healing of the species in the planet, but the potentiality, mm-hmm. right? Because it, it, it liberates us from these trauma loops that we keep reliving and right. and deepening. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. I mean, that's the thing is that it's really like we're talking about all the work to do to get over the shame and the trauma and therapy therapy is great and like EMDR therapy there's certain trauma therapies but I do think that with and we've seen this I mean we've seen like you know people who have been on medications and they do one session of something and they you know psilocybin or ketamine and they're like it's transformative so imagine like whatever trauma is holding you back from sex being present is also holding you back in other areas of your life so Mm. it's really going to be like I think that they all like feed into each other and yes it would be huge for sexuality for Mm. sure and um so I love that. I love that. I'm on my own journey with that. So mm-hmm. that's been fun. Great. Well, is there anything else you wish I had asked you? Is there anything else you feel excited to talk about? Besides, I mean, so the book, obviously, <laughs> Smart Sex, which is so exciting. And this lube. Thank you for this gift. Oh, yeah. Playground so, lubricant. Okay. It and is so like... After Hours is a type of playground lubricant? Yes. Okay. There's four different kinds. Okay. There's After Hours. And there's like date night and they all have different essences. So they're not necessarily scents because sometimes people are flavors, but they have like an essence. And I think this one's like the musk and sandalwood. Mm -hmm. And what I love about Playground is that it is a lubricant that has all these feel good ingredients. Like it has some supplements that I take like black Mm. cohosh and ashwagandha and vitamin E and it's vegan And like I said, it's like a facial for your vagina. So it feels good because for so long, like not only have we not studied female sexuality, but like the lubricants or like there's one formula that everyone was using because it's really expensive to go make a new lubricant. It's a long story. And there was all had this, this um, government regulation. And it was like really not great to put inside of you. And it was like petroleum based. Yeah. It was bad. It's bad for condoms, bad for your body. I mean, women have to be careful what we put inside of us. We don't want like sugars or if you can't understand the ingredients on a, on a product, you shouldn't put it inside of you. But you were at my serious XM office, but we get like 20 pounds of sex toys delivered for the last 20 years. I've tried every toy, every product, every sex accessory on the planet. So we just launched a, sh- a shop with Emily's store that it's really curated with just like if you've been looking for like the right vibrator or lube or like handcuffs or it's really is the stuff that I found in all different price points that could really you know be a the next thing that someone might be desiring in their sex life and be like the right product you know because like, I Ooh. know I would never recommend something that I haven't tried so check that out my book my podcast sign and up the my podcast is sex with Emily sex with Emily so where's the best place online to find you is I it mean, it's sex with Emily.com and all social media is sex with Emily and also okay. sign up for my newsletter you can do that on my website um, my newsletter comes out like once a week and it's just, it's kind of a recap of everything happening with sex, happening with the show. We have tons of articles at sexwithemily.com. We release several a week 
um, mm. that are just really answering questions, helping people have the sex life they deserve. Oh, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for the bravery and dedication to answer the call at a time that I'm sure that it was not easy and the amount of pushback that you might have, must have gotten and for the amount of lives that you have transformed, the amount of shame that you have transmuted and liberated. Like blessings, blessings, blessings <laughs> to you God. for all of the work that you have done and extra blessings for all the work that is to come as you step into these new chapters and these new versions of yourself. So I'm so, Thanks, so Emily. excited for you and I'm so happy to know you and to mm. deepen our friendship. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. This is wonderful. I love your podcast. All right, sweet friends. If you have fallen in love with Emily as much as I have, make sure you (laughs) check her out at Sex with Emily all over the interwebs. And if you have enjoyed this episode, or if you think that there is someone who might benefit from having smarter sex, from getting to know their own pleasure and their own turn on, someone who might uh, benefit from having less shame in their bodies around sex and sexuality, please do share this episode with them. You can always give it a five-star rating, leave us a review. And if you liked it, you could screenshot it and then tag us. I'm at Ziva Meditation. She's at Sex with Emily. And share it with your friends so that we can create a world filled with sexually liberated people having much smarter sex. I love you. I love you. I love you. And I will see you next week.